Rule 132 Presentation of Evidence. A. Examination of Witnesses. Section 1. Examination to be done in open court. The examination of witnesses presented in a trial or hearing shall be done in open court, and under oath or arm action. Unless the witness is incapacitated to speak, or the question calls for a de-errant mode of answer, the answers of the witness shall be given orally. Section 2. Proceedings to be recorded. The entire proceedings of a trial or hearing, including the questions propounded to a witness and his or her answers thereto, and the statements made by the judge or any of the parties, counsel, or witnesses with reference to the case, shall be recorded by means of shorthand or stenotype or by other means of recording found suitable by the court. A transcript of the record of the proceedings made by the OCL stenographer, stenotypist or recorder and certa ed as correct by him or her, shall be deemed prima facie a correct statement of such proceedings. Section 3. Rights and Obligations of a Witness. A witness must answer questions, although his or her answer may tend to establish a claim against him or her. However, it is the right of a witness. 1. To be protected from irrelevant, improper, or insulting questions, and from harsh or insulting demeanor. 2. Not to be detained longer than the interests of justice require. 3. Not to be examined except only as to matters pertinent to the issue. 4. Not to give an answer which will tend to subject him or her to a penalty for an oence unless otherwise provided by law, or. 5. Not to give an answer which will tend to degrade his or her reputation, unless it be to the very fact at issue or to a fact from which the fact in issue would be presumed but a witness must answer to the fact of his or her previous NAL conviction for an ONS. Section 4. Order in the examination of an individual witness. The order in which an individual witness may be examined is as follows. a. Direct examination by the proponent. b. Cross-examination by the opponent. c. Redirect examination by the proponent. d. Re-cross-examination by the opponent. Section 5. Direct examination. Direct examination is the examination in chief of a witness by the party presenting him or her on the facts relevant to the issue. Section 6. Cross-examination. Its purpose and extent. Upon the termination of the direct examination, the witness may be cross-examined by the adverse party on any relevant matter, with succinct fullness and freedom to test his or her accuracy and truthfulness and freedom from interest or bias, or the reverse, and to elicit all important facts bearing upon the issue. Section 7. Redirect examination. Its purpose and extent. After the cross-examination of the witness has been concluded, he or she may be re-examined by the party calling him or her to explain or supplement his or her answers given during the cross-examination. On redirect examination, questions on matters not dealt with during the cross-examination may be allowed by the court in its discretion. Section 8. Recross examination. Upon the conclusion of the redirect examination, the adverse party may recross examine the witness on matters stated in his or her redirect examination, and also on such other matters as may be allowed by the court in its discretion. Section 9. Recalling witness. After the examination of a witness by both sides has been concluded, the witness cannot be recalled without leave of the court. The court will grant or withhold leave in its discretion, as the interests of justice may require. Section 10. Leading and misleading questions. A question which suggests to the witness the answer which the examining party desires as a leading question. It is not allowed, except a. on cross-examination, b. on preliminary matters, c. when there is difficulty in getting direct and intelligible answers from a witness who is ignorant, a child of tender years, is of feeble mind, or a deaf mute, d. of an unwilling or hostile witness, or e of a witness who is an adverse party or an OCER, director, or managing agent of a public or private corporation, or of a partnership or association which is an adverse party. A misleading question is one which assumes as true a fact not yet testy ed to by the witness, or contrary to that which he or she has previously stated. It is not allowed. Section 11. Impeachment of adverse party's witness. A witness may be impeached by the party against whom he or she was called, by contradictory evidence, by evidence that his or her general reputation for truth, honesty, or integrity is bad, or by evidence that he or she has made at other times statements inconsistent with his or her present testimony, but not by evidence of particular wrongful acts, except that it may be shown by the examination of the witness, or record of the judgment, that he or she has been convicted of an ONS. Section 12. Impeachment by evidence of conviction of crime. For the purpose of impeaching a witness, evidence that he or she has been convicted by NAL judgment of a crime shall be admitted if, a, the crime was punishable by a penalty in excess of one, year, or, b, 
the crime involved moral turpitude, regardless of the penalty. However, evidence of a conviction is not admissible if the conviction has been the subject of an amnesty or annulment of the conviction. Section 13. Party may not impeach his or her own witness, except with respect to witnesses referred to in paragraphs D and E of Section 10 of this rule. The party presenting the witness is not allowed to impeach his or her credibility. A witness may be considered as unwilling or hostile only if so declared by the court upon adequate showing of his or her adverse interest, unjusty ed reluctance to testify, or his or her having misled the party into calling him or her to the witness stand. The unwilling or hostile witness so declared, or the witness who is an adverse party, may be impeached by the party presenting him or her in all respects as if he or she had been called by the adverse party, except by evidence of his or her bad character. He or she may also be impeached and cross-examined by the adverse party, but such cross-examination must only be on the subject matter of his or her examination in chief. Section 14. How witness impeached by evidence of inconsistent statements. Before a witness can be impeached by evidence that he or she has made at other times statements inconsistent with his or her present testimony, the statements must be related to him or her, with the circumstances of the times and places and the persons present, and he or she must be asked whether he or she made such statements, and if so, allowed to explain them. If the statements be in writing, they must be shown to the witness before any question is put to him or her concerning them. Section 15. Exclusion and Separation of Witnesses. The court, motu proprio or upon motion, shall order witnesses excluded so that they cannot hear the testimony of other witnesses. This rule does not authorize exclusion of a. a party who is a natural person, b. a duly designated representative of a juridical entity which is a party to the case, c. a person whose presence is essential to the presentation of the party's cause, or d. a person authorized by a statute to be present. The court may also cause witnesses to be kept separate and to be prevented from conversing with one another, directly or through intermediaries, until all shall have been examined. Section 16. When witness may refer to memorandum. A witness may be allowed to refresh his or her memory respecting a fact by anything written or recorded by himself or herself, or under his or her direction, at the time when the fact occurred, or immediately thereafter, or at any other time when the fact was fresh in his or her memory and he or she knew that the same was correctly written or recorded but in such case the writing or record must be produced and may be inspected by the adverse party. Who may, if he or she chooses, cross-examine the witness upon it and may read it in evidence. A witness may also testify from such a writing or record, though he or she retains no recollection of the particular facts, if he or she is able to swear that the writing or record correctly stated the transaction when made, but such evidence must be received with caution. Section 17. When part of transaction, writing or record given in evidence, the remainder admissible. When part of an act, declaration, conversation, writing or record is given in evidence by one party, the whole of the same subject may be inquired into by the other, and when a detached act, declaration, conversation, writing or record is given in evidence, any other act, declaration, conversation, writing or record necessary to its understanding may also be given in evidence. Section 18. Right to inspect writing shown to witness. Whenever a writing is shown to a witness, it may be inspected by the adverse party. b. Authentication and proof of documents. Section 19. Classes of documents. For the purpose of their presentation in evidence, documents are either public or private. Public documents are a. The written OCL acts, or records of the sovereign authority, OCL bodies and tribunals, and public OCERS, whether of the Philippines or of a foreign country. b. Documents acknowledged before a notary public except last wills and testaments. c. Documents that are considered public documents under treaties and conventions which are in force between the Philippines and the country of source, and d. Public records, kept in the Philippines, of private documents required by law to be entered therein. All other writings are private. Section 20. Proof of private document, s. Before any private document or word as authentic is received in evidence, its due execution and authenticity must be proved by any of the following means. a. By anyone who saw the document executed or written. b. By evidence of the genuineness of the signature or handwriting of the maker, or c. By other evidence showing its due execution and authenticity. Any other private document need only be identified as that which it is claimed to be. Section 21. When evidence of authenticity of private document not necessary. Where a private document is more than 30 years old, is produced from a custody in which it would naturally be found if genuine, and is unblemished by any alterations or circumstances of suspicion, 
no other evidence of its authenticity need be given. Section 22. How genuineness of handwriting proved. The handwriting of a person may be proved by any witness who believes it to be the handwriting of such person because he or she has seen the person write, or has seen writing purporting to be his or hers upon which the witness has acted or been charged, and has thus acquired knowledge of the handwriting of such person. Evidence respecting the handwriting may also be given by a comparison, made by the witness or the court, with writings admitted or treated as genuine by the party against whom the evidence is owed, or proved to be genuine to the satisfaction of the judge. Section 23. Public documents as evidence. Documents consisting of entries in public records made in the performance of a duty by a public OCER are prima facie evidence of the facts therein stated. All other public documents are evidence, even against a third person, of the fact which gave rise to their execution and of the date of the latter. Section 24. Proof of OCL record. The record of public documents referred to in paragraph of section 19, when admissible for any purpose, may be evidenced by an OCL publication thereof or by a copy attested by the OCER having the legal custody of the record, or by his or her deputy, and accompanied, if the record is not kept in the Philippines, with a certicate that such OCER has the custody. If the OCE in which the record is kept is in a foreign country, which is a contracting party to a treaty or convention to which the Philippines is also a party, are considered a public document under such treaty or convention pursuant to paragraph C of section 19 hereof, the certicate or its equivalent shall be in the form prescribed by such treaty or convention subject to reciprocity granted to public documents originating from the Philippines. For documents originating from a foreign country which is not a contracting party to a treaty or convention referred to in the next preceding sentence, the certicate may be made by a secretary of the embassy or legation, consul general, consul, vice consul, or consular agent or by any OCER in the foreign service of the Philippines stationed in the foreign country in which the record is kept, and authenticated by the seal of his, or her, OCE. A document that is accompanied by a certicate or its equivalent may be presented in evidence without further proof, the certicate or its equivalent being prima facie evidence of the due execution and genuineness of the document involved. The certicate shall not be required when a treaty or convention between a foreign country and the Philippines has abolished the requirement, or has exempted the document itself from this formality. Section 25. What attestation of copy must state. Whenever a copy of a document or record is attested for the purpose of evidence, the attestation must state, in substance, that the copy is a correct copy of the original, or a specie part thereof, as the case may be. The attestation must be under the OCL seal of the attesting OCER, if there be any, or if he or she be the clerk of a court having a seal, under the seal of such court. Section 26. Irremovability of public record. Any public record, an OCL copy of which is admissible in evidence, must not be removed from the OCE in which it is kept, except upon order of a court where the inspection of the record is essential to the just determination of a pending case. Section 27. Public record of a private document. An authorized public record of a private document may be proved by the original record, or by a copy thereof, attested by the legal custodian of the record, with an appropriate certicate that such OCER has the custody. Section 28. Proof of lack of record. A written statement signed by an OCER having the custody of an OCL record or by his or her deputy that, after diligent search, no record or entry of a speciad tenor is found to exist in the records of his or her OCE, accompanied by a certicate as above provided, is admissible as evidence that the records of his or her OCE contain no such record or entry. Section 29. How judicial record impeached. Any judicial record may be impeached by evidence of a want a jurisdiction in the court or judicial OCER, b. collusion between the parties, or c. fraud in the party owing the record, in respect to the proceedings. Section 30. Proof of notarial documents. Every instrument duly acknowledged or proved in certa ed as provided by law, may be presented in evidence without further proof, the certicate of acknowledgement being prima facie evidence of the execution of the instrument or document involved. Section 31. Alteration in document, how to explain. The party producing a document as genuine which has been altered and appears to have been altered after its execution, in a part material to the question in dispute, must account for the alteration. He or she may show that the alteration was made by another, without his or her concurrence, or was made with the consent of the parties acted by it, or was otherwise properly or innocently made, or that the alteration did not change the meaning or language of the instrument. If he or she fails to do that, the document shall not be admissible in evidence. Section 32. Seal. 
There shall be no deference between sealed and unsealed private documents insofar as their admissibility as evidence is concerned. Section 33. Documentary evidence in an UNO CL language. Documents written in an UNO CL language shall not be admitted as evidence, unless accompanied with a translation into English or Filipino. To avoid interruption of proceedings, parties or their attorneys are directed to have such translation prepared before trial. C. Offer an objection. Section 34. Ower of evidence. The court shall consider no evidence which has not been formally owered. The purpose for which the evidence is owered must be speci ed. Section 35. When to make ower. All evidence must be owered orally. The ower of the testimony of a witness in evidence must be made at the time the witness is called to testify. The ower of documentary and object evidence shall be made after the presentation of a party's testimonial evidence. Section 36. Objection. Objection to ower of evidence must be made orally immediately after the ower is made. Objection to the testimony of a witness for lack of a formal ower must be made as soon as the witness begins to testify. Objection to a question propounded in the course of the oral examination of a witness must be made as soon as the grounds therefore become reasonably apparent. The grounds for the objections must be speci ed. Section 37. When repetition of objection unnecessary. When it becomes reasonably apparent in the course of the examination of a witness that the questions being propounded are of the same class as those to which objection has been made, whether such objection was sustained or overruled, it shall not be necessary to repeat the objection, it being suscient for the adverse party to record his or her continuing objection to such class of questions. Section 38. Ruling. The ruling of the court must be given immediately after the objection is made, unless the court desires to take a reasonable time to inform itself on the question presented but the ruling shall always be made during the trial and at such time as will give the party against whom it is made an opportunity to meet the situation presented by the ruling. The reason for sustaining or overruling an objection need not be stated. However, if the objection is based on two or more grounds, a ruling sustaining the objection on one or some of them must specify the ground or grounds relied upon. Section 39. Striking out of answer. Should a witness answer the question before the adverse party had the opportunity to voice fully its objection to the same, or where a question is not objectionable, but the answer is not responsive, or where a witness testi s without a question being posed or testi s beyond limits set by the court, or when the witness does a narration instead of answering the question, and such objection is found to be meritorious, the court shall sustain the objection and order such answer, testimony or narration to be stricken o the record. On proper motion, the court may also order the striking out of answers which are incompetent, irrelevant, or otherwise improper. Section 40. Tender of excluded evidence. If documents or things owered in evidence are excluded by the court, the owerer may have the same attached to or made part of the record. If the evidence excluded is oral, the owerer may state for the record the name and other personal circumstances of the witness and the substance of the proposed testimony. Rule 133. Weight and sufficiency of evidence. Section 1. Preponderance of evidence, how determined. In civil cases, the party having the burden of proof must establish his or her case by a preponderance of evidence. In determining where the preponderance or superior weight of evidence on the issues involved lies, the court may consider all the facts and circumstances of the case, the witness's manner of testifying, their intelligence, their means and opportunity of knowing the facts to which they are testifying, the nature of the facts to which they testify, the probability or improbability of their testimony, their interest or want of interest, and also their personal credibility so far as the same may legitimately appear upon the trial. The court may also consider the number of witnesses, though the preponderance is not necessarily with the greater number. Section 2. Proof beyond reasonable doubt. In a criminal case, the accused is entitled to an acquittal, unless his or her guilt is shown beyond reasonable doubt. Proof beyond reasonable doubt does not mean such a degree of proof as, excluding possibility of error, produces absolute certainty. Moral certainty only is required, or that degree of proof which produces conviction in an unprejudiced mind. Section 3. Extrajudicial confession, not suscient ground for conviction. An extrajudicial confession made by an accused shall not be suscient ground for conviction, unless corroborated by evidence of corpus delicti. Section 4. Circumstantial evidence, when suscient. Circumstantial evidence is suscient for conviction if a. There is more than one, circumstance b. The facts from which the inferences are derived are proven, and c. The combination of all the circumstances is such as to produce a conviction beyond reasonable doubt. 
Inferences cannot be based on other inferences. Section 5. Weight to be given opinion of expert witness, how determined. In any case where the opinion of an expert witness is received in evidence, the court has a wide latitude of discretion in determining the weight to be given to such opinion, and for that purpose may consider the following. A. Whether the opinion is based upon suscient facts or data. B. Whether it is the product of reliable principles and methods. C. Whether the witness has applied the principles and methods reliably to the facts of the case, and d. Such other factors as the court may deem helpful to make such determination. n. Section 6. Substantial evidence. In cases led before administrative or quasi-judicial bodies, a fact may be deemed established if it is supported by substantial evidence, or that amount of relevant evidence which a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to justify a conclusion. Section 7. Power of the court to stop further evidence. The court may stop the introduction of further testimony upon any particular point when the evidence upon it is already so full that more witnesses to the same point cannot be reasonably expected to be additionally persuasive. This power shall be exercised with caution. Section 8. Evidence on motion. When a motion is based on facts not appearing of record, the court may hear the matter on a davits or depositions presented by the respective parties, but the court may direct that the matter be heard wholly or partly on oral testimony or depositions. 